Alrighty, folks, today we are here to talk about all about that bass, about that bass, no treble. And this has been a widely requested video in the Garage Rock series. If you remember, we started with guitar, then we went to drums, and then finally vocals. Now, if you haven't seen any of those, I highly recommend you watching those first because there is going to be a lot of background information in those videos, especially the first one, the guitar one, that I am not going to be talking about in this video for the sake of repeating myself every single time. You know, I talk about the socioeconomic history of garage rock, I talk about the approach, the tone, the attitude, everything in between, right? So if you haven't seen that, you really need to watch that before we move on in this video. The bass is the often most forgotten about role of any band. Usually, this is delegated to the loser in the friend group that isn't very musically inclined and not too bright in the head, right? They usually got braces and funky breath. They never get any ladies. They're always at the back of the stage looking all weird and It's all true. It's all true what they say about bass players, but we must make it clear that this is a very important part of the band. Between the drummer and the bass player, they need to work together to lay the foundations of the band for the rest of the instrumentation to follow. Without the bass player, a garage rock band is nothing. We are going to glance upon a few things in this video today. The first thing we're going to look at is the equipment that a bass player is going to be using. We're going to talk about recording methods to record that bass player in the studio. Then we're going to do a short little writing lesson where I put the little bass in my lap and slap some strings. And then finally, we are going to look at some musical examples. First, let's start with the equipment. If you're going for a true 1960s approach, there is a plethora of period correct bass guitars that you use. Some popular ones are the Gibson EBOs, EB2s, you got your Hofner styles, you got Kingston basses, you got cheapo silver tones, cheapo fenders, the list goes on and on and on. My personal favorite is a cheap Japanese Fender knockoff, and this is what I have used for 99% of my recordings. So this bass guitar is a short scale knockoff of a jazz Fender bass, and it has plenty and plenty of issues. The volume knobs only work on full blast. The tone knob, if you even think about using it, just starts sounding like a beehive in the summer heat, just buzzing along. You know, a third of the frets are dead on the neck. You know, it's a mess. But the point is, is that something like this is perfect for garage rock because garage rock is, is all about using what you got and not spending a bunch of fat stacks, getting a period correct guitar and spending $3,000 on something that's period correct. You don't really need to go that route. Something simple and something that you already have is going to be perfect for garage rock. You know, I bought this baby for 50 bucks off a junkie on Craigslist. So, you know, you could really find stuff like this all over and it'll work perfect just for you. And really, if you want a 60s bass guitar sound, the first thing you gotta do to your bass guitar is get rid of the damn round wounds on that guitar and put some flat wounds. And flat wounds were the standard bass guitar string up until, say, the mid 70s or so. And, you know, this is going to give you a much more mellower sound. It's not going to be as front in the mix. It's going to lay back a little more. And I know a lot of modern garage rockers love the attack of a round wound, but there are other ways to get around that. And honestly, if you're looking for a true 60s garage rock sound, you're going to want a bass guitar that sits a little back in the mix and isn't so aggressive anyway. So that is a must. Put some wormies, as my buddy Alex likes to say, on your bass guitar because round wounds are not going to get you where you want to be. Another period correct thing kids would do to their bass guitars is put a little piece of foam like so into their pickup covers and this way it damps the string a little bit, it cuts down on sustain and they did this to get a more stand-up bass sound from their bass guitars, trying to mimic a lot of the 1950s rock and roll bass sounds that they were hearing on the records. So that's something that I really recommend. If you don't have uh, pickup covers like so, there are other ways to muffle the string to try to get sounds like that. You could put stuff in uh, under the string. I've used socks before. There's really um, you know, multiple ways to kind of dampen the string like that to cut down on the sustain and kind of mimic a upright bass. For your guitar cable, I really highly recommend a tweed cable as that is going to give you a more vintage tone than a black cable. 
And when it comes to guitar amps, I'm gonna have similar things to say as it goes for guitars. You know, you could get really stuck in the rabbit hole of trying to get a period correct amp. You know, you got Fender amps, you got Ampeg amps, you got Premier amps, and you don't really wanna go down that rabbit hole. It's really just what you got is fine enough. If you have a tube amp for your bass, even better. If not, a solid state amp can do you just fine. It's all about the approach and your attitude for Garage Rock. It is not about the equipment. And the bass amp that I use is a 80s era PV amp, solid state, nothing to write home about. The one thing that I do want to add about amps in conjunction with flat wounds is you're going to want to play with the EQ knobs quite a bit to get the high end where you need it to be and to make sure that the bass doesn't just get completely lost in the mix. Other than that, I don't really have much guidance. It's really going to depend on your bass guitar, the room, and the song that you are playing in. All right, now let's move on to recording the bass in your home recording studio. And as I explained in previous videos, it's impossible to give one specific technique that you should be using in your studio because 1960s Garage Rock covered a wide variety of different circumstances, different budgets, different equipment, you know, you could have been recording on a one track machine, a two track machine, a four track machine. You could have had one mic in the whole room. You could have had close mics on everything. Maybe your bass was even DI'd in some rare circumstances. You know, it's impossible to give one single technique that you should be doing. Instead, you should be reflecting this wide variety of circumstances in your home recording studio and trying many different things and seeing what fits best in your specific space. However, I will add that to me, it, based upon my ears, my knowledges, and my own taste, when I think of a quintessential 1960s garage rock band, I don't hear a close mic on the bass guitar amps. I am hearing bass guitars uh, amps that are being captured by a room mic much farther away from the amp and much more of an ambient sound. Here are some examples. Now compare those songs to a song like Tobacco Road by the Nashville Teens where the budget's a little higher, they probably had a close mic on the bass amp, and that bass is going to be a lot more in your face. So it's really going to depend on what sound you are going to be looking for. Personally, I have never been able to make a DI'd bass track work in my home recording studio. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but every time I record one, I record it in tandem with a my bass amp mic, and I always wind up just getting rid of the DI track. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know if it's just my personal taste on what I like, but I don't think that is something you should shy away from by any means. I know a lot of people have great experiences with DI'ing their bass. And I must be honest with you guys. Most of the time in my recording studio when I'm recording bass, I just take an SM57 and put it right against the grill cloth. I know, I know. I've become what I hate. I just made a whole video mocking people who just stick an SM57 right against the grill cloth to record their electric guitar. But I don't know what to say. There's something about a combination of this bass guitar, my amp, an SM57, and the room I'm recording in that just makes it work. Now, the SM57 is going to be a little more of a modern sound. It's going to be a little more aggressive. There's going to be a mid-range uh, mid uh, bump. There's also going to be the proximity effect that is going to boost the low end when you have a mic at the grill cloth like that. And you do have to be careful with this and play with the EQ on your bass because you don't want the low end to be too overwhelming and too muddy. And I will recommend that if you're going for a more true 1960s garage rock sound, you might want to try a microphone that is a little more neutral in frequency response, something like the EVRE mics that I talk about, like something like that is going to give you, um, you know, a more natural sound for your bass guitar amp. And on occasion, I do like to replicate that classic 1960s bass guitar sound where it is 
really pushed far back in the mix and I will take my close mic and pull it way back from the bass guitar amp. This way I get a more open and ambient and roomy sound and you know that is something once again that you should not shy away from by any means. The next thing we must talk about is compression when you are recording your bass. And if you're going for a true 1960s garage rock sound, you are going to want to limit your compression at all costs. Ideally, you're going to have no compression at all, because most likely in those studios, they were not compressing the bass. And if you are close micing your bass, however, it's going to be hard to get away without putting any compression at all, especially the way modern music is recorded. And the more inexperienced the bass player that you are recording, the more compression that you need. When I am recording myself, I am usually pretty aggressive with my compression ratio because my technique is all over the place. I'm inexperienced and without, you know, a compression ratio of maybe 6 to 1 or 8 to 1, my bass guitar volume is just all over the place in my mix. Now, when I'm recording someone who is more experienced like my buddy Alex, you know, I could get away with a compression ratio of maybe 3 to 1, 4 to 1. I'm really going to be depend on the aggressiveness of the song. But once again, you really want to limit this to the, your a maximum extent possible if you're going for a true 60s sound. And once you are done tracking your bass, it is now time to move on to the mixing stage. And if you're staying true to the 1960s sound and approach, you are going to want to keep your mixing to an absolute minimum. Remember, you probably did not have an individual track for your bass guitar. So you're not going to be EQing, you're not going to be changing volume, you're not going to be applying compression after the fact. Um, you're obviously not going to put a thousand goddamn plugins on the thing. All of that magic had to be captured right at that microphone during the tracking process. And all of that mojo is not going to come from the equipment that you're using. Most of it is going to come from the player and the written material. And that is what we're going to talk about next, writing a bass guitar track. If you are going to take anything from the Garage Rock series is that it is all about the energy and attitude of your writing and playing. It is not about specific equipment, mics, recording techniques, or anything like that. It is about being in the garage with your boys and trying to get all of that teenager angst out of you. And best of all, you were the bass player. You just got dumped, you just got an effing chemistry, and the local jocks just gave you a swirly in the high school bathroom. And now it is time to take out all of that frustration with your two little fingies here on your bass guitar strings. Something that you need to keep in mind whenever you're trying to replicate any sort of era is that you shouldn't necessarily just be listening to the music from that time in specific niche for your own influences. Remember that those people weren't listening to that music. For example, the kids in the early 1960s bands weren't listening to 1960s garage rock bands, right? They were listening to the old 50s rockers and R&B artists and pulling influences from there. That's where their roots were coming from. It really wasn't until the latter half of the 1960s where garage rock started to become a little more self-referential, a little more psychedelic, and started to pull from itself, right? So if you're going for a true early 60s track, Try to listen to a lot of 50s R&B artists, a lot of 50s rock and roll, and try to pull some influence from there because a lot of the songwriting is going to be mimicking the styles that were being played in that time. The first writing exercise we're going to look at here is Old Reliable for bass. And this is when you strictly just play the root notes of the chords that the guitar player is playing. This is going to be the simplest method for writing on bass, and a lot of the times it's often all you need to get your point across for the song. And certainly do not be afraid to throw a little bit of syncopation in there to break up the rhythm in conjunction with the drums. Will I be back again? This same method could be applied to when a guitar is simply playing a riff and the bass player is just mimicking the said riff on the bass guitar.
Once again, this is a really simple method, but a lot of the times it is perfect for the song at hand. And while the bass player is often going to look towards the guitar player to figure out what notes they should be playing, it is often the drummer that the bass player should be looking to to figure out the rhythm. The following is an example where the bass player is not following the rhythm of the guitar player, but instead following the rhythm of the drums. The next stage of your bass playing should incorporate playing other notes within that chord. So for example, if the guitar player is playing an A major chord, the bass player can be playing the root note A, they could be playing the major third C sharp, they could be playing the fifth E, etc. And remember, just because you're the bass player doesn't mean you can't take a melodic role in the instrumentation. Here's a quick example of me doing a really basic riff in the pentatonic scale. Nothing like being this popularity. Yeah. 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 Okay, Ellie. Now there's a girl that would really get my vote. Okay, I'll go ahead. Why not? The last thing I want to talk about is a walking bass line, and this was a style that was very popular in the 1950s, especially with upright basses. And remember what I said, that the early 1960s garage rockers were pulling a lot from those 50s artists, so something I wanted to go over. Walking bass lines are very simple. You are going to play a steady quarter note rhythm, and you're not going to repeat any notes, and most of the time you're just working your way up the chord that you are playing in. Since I don't actually have any songs that feature a walking bass line, I'm just going to do a really simple guitar loop of me playing a simple chord progression, and I'm going to play a walking bass line over it. All right, now let's listen to some examples.
That is it for today's video. Hopefully you learned a thing or two. If you are going to grab anything from today's video is one, throw some flat wounds on that base. Get rid of those damn freaking gritty round wounds. And two, do not get so caught up on the term garage rock. I really do not like defining music like that and making kind of videos like this where I'm making some really broad strokes to music genres because garage rock is not about specific microphones or specific bass guitars or recording methods or anything like that. It's all about the energy and attitude and putting your own personal flair on your music. Do you think people like Ty Siegel or John Dwyer or King Gizzard, etc., etc., are worrying about how specifically things were recorded in different eras? No, of course not. Of course, they are going to be pulling from different eras, sure, that is um, obvious, but they don't let it completely override their songwriting. They have their own personal flair on their music, and you should too. So hopefully I'm able to spur some creativity in you, you are inspired to get the hell off YouTube, go into your recording studio, record some music. Um, if you'd like, I'd probably tell you to subscribe, but you got better things to do, okay, people? All right, so... We have one more video left in this series. I'm sure you could guess what instrument we will be touching upon. Um, you know, I'll probably get around to that like nine months from now. So look out for that. And that's it. I'm going to stop talking. I love you all. Um, um, I never know how to end these videos. Yep.